Well, so I'll start off with uh, one question on the intellectual products that Future Earth will be talking about a lot in the upcoming mm -hmm. weeks. Uh, are there some that you're more involved in uh, more than others? I'm not involved in any of them, uh, so to say, scientifically in the sense that I'm involved in projects because I'm uh, as uh, the Vice Director of uh, United mm -hmm. Nations University, I'm representing United Nations mm -hmm. University in the Governing Council, mm -hmm. so I'm more occupied with, uh, so to say, the, yeah, the strategic uh, processes inside uh, the university. But I'm, of course, very, very much interested, actually. My own uh, background is environmental risks, so natural hazards and so mm -hmm. on. And uh, I think it's an important part of, uh, of uh, the, the, the strategy of, of future. So I'm, uh, I would say I'm very much interested in, in many of these, uh, uh, of these intellectual products. And uh, I think uh, uh, we have to put a particular emphasis on, is actually to, to come up with intellectual products which uh, are really interdisciplinary in the sense that they involve natural and social sciences, which is always a big challenge actually, but I think it's one uh, yeah, it's mm. where the uh, future can really do a lot. Actually, maybe we can cut into this question because this is uh, something that we find very fascinating, but we want to learn more about. Um, how familiar are you with transdisciplinary work, and you know how does that make its way into future? Yeah. I think I'm very familiar with transdisciplinary work in okay. practice because uh, I started out as a as a physicist and not as an as an environmental mm -hmm. physicist, but I was a theoretical physicist doing mostly mathematics. <laughs> Uh, after my PhD, I decided that uh, while this has been fantastic three years, uh, I needed to, to do something more applied, mm -hmm. so I went to industry. And uh, I worked in a big uh, company which had a big uh, lab, uh, which had even a group for theoretical physics, but it meant something completely different. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to work for product development, actually, and we had to try to understand the people who uh, had to sell uh, the machinery actually which was developed but which needed a lot of science actually to be developed mm. and uh, this was actually uh, although sometimes you would not look at industrial research as tra transdisciplinary actually but it was very really transdisciplinary in the sense that we as uh, theoretical physicists and mathematicians had to talk to the people who, are, who, who were actually uh, trying to find ways of, uh, of, of, of selling the devices which we, mm. which we made. So this was the first time I, I actually really worked at the, on the bridge of, uh, 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 b between science and, uh, and application, which was uh, when you're working in industry, application is selling products. Mm. Uh, it was quite harsh in the sense that if we didn't do this kind of transdisciplinary jobs, then there was no money anymore. <laughs> and uh, then I changed my field. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, to become uh, uh, first the division leader and then the director of the Institute for Snow and Avalanche Research. Mm. And the theme there was, uh, the, 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 the purpose of this institute was actually to improve uh, avalanche safety, not only in Switzerland, but we cooperated very internationally also with Canada, by the way. Okay. Uh, and uh, it, this is a, a domain, actually, which when you uh, try to improve safety, you need a lot mm. of science, actually. Mm. So you can't do it without, uh, without science. So improving uh, avalanche early warning systems uh, really needs to do a lot of modeling, a lot of observations, uh, uh, geo-observations, and so on. Mm. Uh, so we had, on one hand, we had about 20 PhD students. On, on the other hand, in the winter, we had to do the daily avalanche forecasts. And the people who do the daily avalanche forecasts, they are uh, typically mountain guides. <laughs> some of them are scientists okay. and some of them are not scientists. And to get them together with the people who improve the snow modeling and who improve the risk management methods mm. was sometimes quite harsh. Uh, they didn't understand each other at all. And when there was a problem, uh, one tried to find the mistake uh, at the side of the other. And mm. this, for me, was really working uh, transdisciplinary. So, so mm. 
uh, the quest for me as a director was actually to kind of get these people together to find, so to say, let's call it business cases for them actually <laughs> to work together. And uh, so uh, in these very different circumstances in industry actually and in environmental risk management, I found that the structurally the basic way you are kind of handling transdisciplinary uh, the, 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 uh, transdisciplinarity is very is very similar actually, and it's always caused by constant type of conflicts. Uh, the practitioners and the scientists they sometimes have different minds, and what I learned is that you should not look at these problems uh, just as problems, but as part of the projects. Huh. Part of the the spirit of transdisciplinarity, and whenever there was a there was a was a success, actually, then I felt I had done a good job. So. Good, yeah. And for you, if you had to describe what uh, transdisciplinarity is, uh, do you have a particular way of of defining it or seeing it? Uh, well, I think there is. Uh, like with interdisciplinarity, for me mm -hmm. there is a kind of uh, of an inappropriate way to look at it and an okay. appropriate way. So let me. This may sound a bit apodictic, <laughs> but uh, the the inappropriate way is to look at interdisciplinarity as a principle and say different sciences have to work together, otherwise a project is not good. Or to say that uh, science and practice have to work together. I mean, what one is called mm -hmm. transdisciplinarity, or a project is not good. I don't think this uh, will lead us far. Uh, however, mm. if we start from goals we have, yeah. from improvements of something which you can't improve without science, then I think inter and transdisciplinarity comes in by itself. Mm. And then even if people are kind of having difficulties to talk to each other, I mean people in practice and in science or in social science and in natural science, mm. uh, seeing the goal actually they want to reach uh, makes it easier, I think. So, so I think transdisciplinarity mm. yeah. and interdisciplinarity uh, is, is kind of uh, best, so to say, looked at from, from the goals actually okay. you want yeah. to achieve. This is, this is how I, I have always tried to look at these, uh, at these terms. Great. Well, that's a very interesting way of. Uh, I, I have yeah. a good colleague actually in Switzerland. Yeah. He has been the uh, uh, the president of the Climate Consortium, so okay. which is kind of you would think that it's kind of natural science oriented. Mm -hmm. He's a professor of social psychology at the University of Zurich, and I think huh. he has really been a master of interdisciplinarity. He once told me, "You see, whenever you can solve a problem in a disciplinary way, do it." Some are simple, some are mathematical problems. Then don't try to involve other, yeah. other. but in most yeah. cases you can't. If you look at the problem, you see that you need to get these, these, uh, these sciences together. <laughs> so he had an interesting approach, actually. He yeah. said, always work as disciplinary as possible. But he was known for being a very interdisciplinary person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, you wouldn't expect that kind of yes. uh, recommendation, right? Yes. And if, for future Earth, uh, how do you see transdisciplinary, or how do you see transdisciplinarity playing a role in its the work that it does? Um, should there, is there more that could be done to include it in uh, one, as one of the core principles? Or I, I think I think it's uh, I, I don't even see it as a kind of a core principle. This is what I was trying <coughs> to say. Mm -hmm. If you are uh, looking at it as yeah. a kind of a principle which you need to obey, no mm -hmm. matter what it. <laughs> what, 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 problem is. Uh, uh, I think we should rather look from the goals actually yeah. of, uh, I mean, future Earth trying to kind of come up with uh, options and ideas for solutions of the, uh, of, yeah. of the problem. Also, and not only look at the problems, but also look at the chances actually uh, science and technology brings. And then you try to kind of make these things useful uh, for society. Okay. or for practice, uh, then you get interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary as, uh, uh, automatically because you will see that there is very few problems that can be solved by chemistry or biology or mm. physics alone mm. uh, or by natural sciences alone or by social sciences alone. Uh, in many cases you need these different components and then mm. inter and transdisciplinarity comes 
uh, automatically, and I see it in all in all the components of futures actually. Mm, okay. But still, it's a big challenge actually for mm. uh, for social and natural scientists to to talk to each other. And it's a big <laughs> challenge actually uh, to for scientists to talk to private business people oh. because uh, scientists often think that. Uh, private business just needs to make money. <laughs> yes, they need to make money. And uh, scientists need to look for the newest method. And these are not the same thing. So you need to come, you need, you need yeah. to get them together. And I think that's one of the, uh, uh, of the most important uh, uh, work and task, actually, the, the senior people in, uh, in, 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 uh, in future Earth have, actually, mm. to motivate young people, actually, to cross boundaries and to, mm. to, to come to them. Okay. If we can um, move back, I actually want to mm. get to uh, your new role as a co-chair for the Governing Council. Could you maybe talk about uh, your experience uh, when you started uh, and how, you know, generally yeah. speaking? Mm -hmm. Well, when I, when I started, I was, uh, uh, I started in November 2010. No, oh, sorry, uh, November 2016. Yes. I was going to uh, say, my, wow, okay. my, my first time Before when, I, when I came into touch with, with, uh, with the precursors mm. of the Future Earth discussion, this was 2010. Okay. Uh, now, as uh, a co-chair of the Governing Council, I started mm. in 2015 at the end. Uh, sorry, at the end of 2016 at the end. Uh, and uh, we have been quite a lot occupied uh, a lot actually with the recruitment of the new uh, executive director mm. after Paul Srivastava in, informed us that he wanted to uh, to step down. So it has maybe been a bit an untypical uh, yeah time. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so when we now hopefully come uh, soon come to a kind of uh, of travel speed with a new uh, executive director, I think uh, one of uh, the things we need to take care of uh, is to to kind of uh, uh, find a way to more effectively reach out to, let me call it the public. I mean, it, in all its different uh, in all its different facets. I think we have a lot of uh, uh, beautiful substance around, but uh, uh, it's during the the growth phase actually, during the build up phase actually, it hasn't been possible in my opinion to kind of really uh, make it visible. Mm. And I think uh, the next step, I think, and it will also be a mm. big task of the new executive director, I think uh, uh, we have to, so to say, uh, to make uh, better use of the beautiful stories, I think, uh, mm -hmm. future as, as we tell already. Yeah. Speaking of beautiful stories, maybe we could talk a little bit more about your personal mm -hmm. uh, side, or what got you passionate about work in physics, uh, environmental risk, and then even further on into the career positions that you have now? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there, there has been several ingredients actually mm -hmm. to, uh, uh, to get me where I am now. Uh, as I have said in the short introduction, I have grown up as a, as a son of a farmer uh, with uh, three, uh, two sisters and a brother. Uh, the brother is, uh, has actually uh, continued, he's a mountain farmer in Switzerland and uh, we had to work on this farm actually, it was quite hard work, steep in the mountains uh, and uh, this actually brought me very close to nature but still I had a, a very clear and strong desire to kind of uh, uh, do something different, I don't know where this came from <laughs> but I uh, had a strong desire to study physics and uh, which I did and then uh, after having worked for uh, 13 years in industry uh, in a city I returned to the mountains actually and I oh. saw how interesting uh, it was a very interesting experience actually to kind of uh, uh, having uh, lived in nature in, in, the, in a quite a wild nature as a child and then uh, coming back as a scientist actually and that has uh, so so the fascination actually for uh, for nature and also in my special case for, uh, for 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 the mountains actually has had a kind of a very diverse uh, base and uh, 
when you are living in the mountains, uh, uh, things such as climate change are extremely well visible, actually. So uh, we uh, saw that uh, the, 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 what we call the snow limit, actually, kind of was really increasing. So uh, when I was a child, actually, there were region uh, which had a lot of snow, actually, uh, which uh, now uh, have more rain than snow. And this is not just the perception of the people. There is very good statistics, actually, which we could actually have the chance to make when I was mm. working at the Snow and Avalanche Research Institute. So this is a very researched area. So the, uh, uh, the effects of climate change are very strong, actually. Mm. And uh, uh, you, for example, have many, many hiking paths, which were very safe when I was a child, which are not even there anymore because they have kind of slided down due to melting per permafrost. Not in, uh, people are mostly talking about melting glaciers, but uh, mm -hmm. melting permafrost is a bit more hidden, but it has actually even more strong effects. So I was uh, in my childhood as well as in my professional life as a scientist and responsible for avalanche early, early warning system, I was really strongly, uh, strongly confront, confronted with these effects. Mm. And we had to try to find solutions for it. Uh, mm -hmm. I was uh, working in the Avalanche Research Center. And then you learn that you sometimes have good ideas uh, as a scientist on how to resolve it, but then uh, you have to work with the politics actually to do mm -hmm. it. And uh, so uh, all these kinds of different facets actually brought me very close uh, to. Uh, and now I learned this in a kind of an extremely wealthy country mm -hmm. uh, such as Switzerland. and now. Working at UN, uh, I uh, tried to apply yeah. similar ideas uh, to much less wealthy countries, and mm. it's uh, one of the interesting things I think I have seen in my professional life uh, to look at, so to say, at the high-tech luxury end of the world, like yeah. Switzerland or Canada, and uh, then seeing that this is just a kind of uh, very, 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 very small corner of the world, actually. Yeah. And, uh, mm when you're talking about environmental risks in uh, many countries in Africa, you're using the same words, but you mean very different things sometimes. Mm. Well, I find it very interesting you talk about solutions and the need for scientists mm -hmm. to be able to, yes. you know, be able to put those into practice. For our audience members, what kind of things do you recommend they could do uh, on a daily basis or what they could do at home that could help uh, some of the causes that Future Earth is working on? Well, I think a, a lot of things are, uh, are done already. For example, uh, when I see how we uh, treated waste, uh, again, going to my home as a child, yeah. where we, uh, and you maybe don't believe it in Switzerland, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, this has been 50 years ago, <laughs> we, we simply threw it into the river. Wow. <laughs> there was very little waste. We, I think we uh, generated about uh, maybe not more than 10% of the waste uh, at this time uh, the people there are, mm. are, 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 are generating now. Yeah. But still, there was no waste disposal system. Mm. And now, uh, of course, my brother separates his waste and of course it is kind of, uh, yeah, kind of, of treated in an orderly way, collected mm. and so on. So I think there has been a huge, uh, uh, huge progress actually. Mm. And uh, I, I know many cities, I don't know how it is in Montreal, but I know uh, many of the European cities actually, Copenhagen for example, I think is slowly transforming into a bike city actually. It's more mm. dangerous actually to, <laughs> you're more threatened by bikes than by cars. Really? Okay. And, uh, uh, the interesting thing, I think, is that uh, it is not happening uh, for climate protection, I think. People don't think mm, about climate yeah. when they do it, but they think it's healthy, actually. So they, 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 uh, they, uh, a green city is definitely more healthy, it's, uh, it's, it's better for your personal, personal health. Mm. So I think there is a lot of... Uh, uh, there is a lot of synergies that actually, actually are used. So if you're asking me what can we do at home, I think as a, so to say, as mm. a, in, in your daily life, I think you can just try to kind of, uh, yeah, 
live in a sustainable way as we as I think there are many yeah many kind of, of quite trivial things like uh, yeah taking care how much meat you eat how you mm. how you treat your waste and so on whether you take the bike or the car I mean just these very normal things but the scientists I think we we in addition really have to try to 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 think about not just about where are the threats uh, yeah. which we uh, can try to, to kind of reuse, but where are the synergies actually where we yeah. can reduce? I mean, where, we, where can we couple, for example, climate protection uh, with health, uh, uh, health improvements and so on? So I think there is lots and lots of things, uh, not just, and I think it's also a matter of the language which we even have to use. I mean, we are always uh, talking about the disaster risk reduction about trying to prevent the apocalypse. But I think we can turn many of the things, uh, so to say, onto a positive side, actually. Uh, using synergies, actually, protect climate while we are trying to live healthy and so mm. on. So, so I think this is also something future Earth, I think, should do, actually, to try to kind of... Huh. Uh, of, uh, of, uh, of peel out, so to say, the so to say positive side effects of uh, mm. of, of a pleasant life. Actually, mm -hmm. and you have, you mentioned um, the contrast and let's say awareness, public awareness mm. about the consequences of poor waste management. Mm. Um, and do you do you have any platforms uh, or recommendations? Uh, for the audience members, uh, anywhere they can follow the work you do, social media, web pages. Mm -hmm. uh, you mean how they can follow the work uh, of yeah. Future Earth? Or your but, work personally. Uh, yes, I mean, I think we have a, uh, uh, yeah, it has been interesting actually, when I came to uh, United Nations University, uh, we had no social media actually, and uh, <laughs> as a, I, I didn't see uh, a particular necessity to go into social media, and then it was the uh, the head of my communication team who told me, "Look, <laughs> uh, you're maybe too old, so I'll tell you." Uh, there is many, many, yeah, many large uh, population groups you just don't reach without uh, yeah. social media. So I think it's a very important platform now. I've learned it, of course, and, uh, which is why uh, we're helping out here, right? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, so. Uh, yes, I think we should. Uh, Future Earth actually, yeah, uh, needs or we need to we need to think a lot, of course, about appropriate uh, platforms and uh, and uh, uh, not not just not just doing good science also, but 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 bringing it, bring it along uh, via the appropriate platforms. I'm not a specialist, honestly, on this. Okay. So I really rely on, uh, on on good communication experts. And how mm. to do it. And then maybe as a last kind of uh, bit, uh, any any particular uh, references, resources you would recommend to the audience? You, you know, if you, there's somebody, a particular research center, or uh, you know, anything that people could go uh, and follow uh, that you would recommend. Well, I think uh, one of one of the features, actually, and I think it will even uh, even get even more colorful in future. One of the features of futures is actually that it kind of uh, mm. offers an umbrella for very many okay. research centers. Mm. Uh, maybe too many, just to give a recommendation. <laughs> and uh, so, so I think uh, what I what I would recommend people is really to go uh, to the Futures homepage or to the other channels and to the open platform actually. The open mm. platform is a, is a kind of, uh, yeah, of trying actually to get as many uh, as possible of the different uh, actors together and make them visible in a, in a concentrated way. I think we're still learning actually with the, with the open platform mm. and, uh, and, uh, and uh, it will probably look different in three years from now. But, <laughs> but yeah, I think in this sense, uh, Future Earth uh, platform and the electronic components of these platforms themselves are actually what I would recommend uh, okay. people to go. Okay, well then I think I think we hit all our points. So I want to thank you for, for this interview. It's been great talking to you. Was it okay? So was it? Yeah. Yeah.